Hello and welcome back to Catapult Your Career, where we delve into the reality of various careers and explore practical advice for numerous professions. Um, and on today's episode, we're, we're uh, switching it up again. Uh, we have got someone who I can't wait to come and speak to today and uh, get them to share their stories with you. It's Bill Betts, who is a pet groomer business coach. Um, but great to have you on the podcast, Bill. Thank you, Michael. Nice to, nice to catch up with you. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and we, we um, both uh, met through various different means. We, we're actually part of a, a, a fairly uh, kind of a coaching circle and coaching community ourselves. Uh, and I've got the pleasure to actually meet Bill in the flesh. It, it, we, we meet so many people online, we think they're avatars. <laughs> actually got to see you. Oh, yeah, you are real. Got to shake your hand uh, in uh, uh, that down Kent way. Um, but yeah, it, it'd be really interesting, Bill, just to start us off. You know, like I said, you're, you're a pet groomer business coach, which you don't often hear. But tell us a little bit about your background. You know, what what, what have you done, you know, in the last few years and your journey, I suppose, mm. to, to kind of where you are now, mate? It is, it's interesting you say about a pet groomer business coach, because um, in 2005, my wife started out as a pet groomer and we had a little fluffy dog. And I was like, what? what's a pet groomer do? I'd, I'd never, <laughs> never heard, you know, we'd never taken our dog to a pet groomer. You know, you just took them in the bath, don't you? And like get them wet, put some yep. shampoo on and uh, and towel them off. But when Emma said to me, right, I'm leaving the um, the vet industry and I'm going to set up my own business as a pet groomer, I'm like, what the hell is that? And now here I am, you know, <laughs> 19, <laughs> was it? 2024, actually yeah. coaching them and helping them set up their business. What a journey. It'd be, it'd be interesting to hear what your, uh, I hope your washing techniques have uh, upgraded since uh, then. <laughs> I've, I've never, I've never been great. Um, well, yeah, I can, I can do reception if need be. I can go into the salon, do reception. I can wash dogs. I can nice. do toenails. Um, but if there are any pet groomers listening, uh, I can never get the dogs proper dry. Mm. What is that? Is it, Emma's like, is the dog completely dry? Yeah, it's dry, and they always get, they always get rejected. So maybe uh, maybe if you do a job bad enough, you get replaced. Yeah, know. you're a clever man. You're a clever man. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 take us yeah, take us into that journey. Like you said, mm. that was just personally, I suppose. You know, you thought, what's this pet groomer nonsense? And 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 you know how the times have changed. You really become um, a bit of a key person. I would say in that industry. And well, that's, really, that's what I try and do is uh, the old key person of in- influence. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit more about what that is. What does that involve for you? Well, it's I suppose it's trying to become like an industry leader, and um, we've spent a lot of time. I suppose I've I've spent some time helping my wife with the business and realizing and understanding what the issues are, and then sort of hanging around in the the Facebook groups, learning what the people, the questions people are putting in, and what they suffer with. So it's kind of like identifying those problems and trying to help people to solve them um and and obviously the the key person of influence you know doing it in different ways having that podcast facebook group you are you are you are they say you are on google and and stuff like that it's been really interesting doing that but you know i joined um i wasn't i wasn't always a business coach as we were going to talk about Uh i joined i joined kent police in 2003 i was very much like this is it this is my 30 year this is my 30 year career pension um company man i just i wanted i, re- I really wanted that security the, the thought of um the thought of being self employed and maybe not being able to generate that money by the end of the month to pay the bills just filled me with so much fear hmm. um my parents had always my dad has always uh, had always worked for the, the same company um a lot of his life was a bit I'd always watched him work for the same company my mum I think a little bit was my mum um worked a lot but also got made redundant quite a bit throughout her sort of working life and um in the 80s like a lot of people got made redundant and they were always okay mum mum always found another job but there was always that oh I'm being made redundant again sort of stress and yeah. I think maybe I fed that fed through that I don't know I don't think they ever meant to sort of pass that stress on, but I think I felt it um, when I sort of look back at my childhood. And I think that's when I came out of school 
Um, and I remember I said to someone the other day, I, I found some old school books from A-levels and it, it had wrote on there like Billy the Copper, Billy, you know, so I'd always, I must have always been telling my mates that I was going to go and join the police. And it was always like, get a nice, good, get a good job, get a pension, you know, made for life, job for life. And that's what I thought of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, thank you for kind of sharing that, Bill. And I think it's interesting how like we're always, you could say, we're always maybe running from that child, like whatever Mm. that experience that child had. And I think about when I, you know, myself, I suppose I I always get the terminology wrong, but I think I'm classed as like a second generation immigrant. So my mum, who's um, Jamaican, dad, English, um, East London, um, well, when my mum obviously moved over to the country and then kind of met my dad and had me, like her whole life was chasing stability and security. Mm. So just like, just like, you know, often doing two jobs, often doing lots of overtime and they were both incredibly like hard working, which is, you know, part of the, what I hold my own work ethic and drive down to is my parents. Um, but as a second generation immigrant, I have the luxury of chasing like fulfillment and joy and stuff like that. But it only, I mean, and I still didn't learn the message. It took me to all like my early twenties to find like fully actually understand and realize that and now be in the space I am now. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I think it's really powerful what you share. Cause I think a lot of other people will resonate with their early childhood and how that's kind of manifested in their present day, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't until I started to learn all about mindset and looking at limiting beliefs some money mindset, you know, mm-hmm. talking to other coaches, doing some training around it. And then um, coaching people myself, you start to say, well, okay, I can hear, I can hear like you've just heard me say the, the fears around childhood and growing up. Yeah. And, and you can say to people, well, where did that come from? Where did that stem from? Who gave you those yeah. fears? Who gave you that worry? And people just think, they grow up with it thinking it's just normal, but actually you yeah. can start highlighting it and say, well, someone's given you that fear. Someone's given you that worry. And it's very, very similar in the, in the police force, police service actually. And you might find it with people that you work with. When, when I used to turn around frustrated with working in the police and go, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to look for another job or I'm going to set up my own business. All you get is a load of people going, oh, what about pension? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but it's like, what what else could you do and get two thousand two hundred pounds a month? Yeah, <laughs> and and you don't realise this, but it's you're you're sucking in all of their fears. Yeah, and they're they're unloading all of their concerns and their fear and their limiting beliefs onto you, and you're like a sponge going, oh yeah, I mean I've, the pension's really good, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, you know, and um, oh about two thousand two hundred pounds a month. Like that's incredible amounts of money. Well, actually, I'm sorry to say it to anyone that's in the police and listening. Yeah. It's not, no, not a lot of money, you know, yeah. on the grand scheme of things. So it's you really suck in a lot of. You be mindful who you share your thoughts and ideas with. That's what I found out in the end. There yeah. were people. There were people on my in in the police that didn't want me to say there's life outside the police service. And then they're yeah. going, oh, tell us about your ideas. What are you going to do sort of thing? Yeah. No, I, I thank you for sharing that, Bill, because I, I absolutely love that. Like there's so many analogies. I mean, lots of people would have heard of the whole crabs in a bucket of like, you know, someone's trying to escape and we pull that crab back down. Um, and I even, you know, uh, like someone I know quite dearly, so, uh, fairly close, um, they were in a, a teaching role. Um, and when someone left their teaching, I had their leaving do they had like a, a deep level of not resentment, but they were like, I wish that was me. Yeah. And the fact they managed to tie into that feeling and that, that emotion, they had the self-awareness and not all of us do. So some people will say those limiting beliefs and concerns to you, not actually realizing they themselves want to go and they themselves want to change. And thankfully that particular person, the individual in mind um, was self-aware to be like, that's strange. Why, why do I wish that was me? And then started looking into that. And then from there, you know, they, they kind of transition their own job. And th- there's a, there's a phrase I often say, which kind of, I think perfectly encapsulate those people who are, oh, but the pension's all right. Or but yeah, but I get to work from home on a Friday, you know, it's not all that bad. And, and I always say, you know, people, people prefer certain misery than embracing the uncertainty of life. Yeah. So, they want the Monday to Friday and then they live for the weekend, Bill. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And and when you're surrounded and, and constantly being told that, and we'd have we'd have managers come in to, you know, this is how good some of the leadership was. They'd come into our and into our briefing rooms and we'd moan and bump our gums about the money, about um, senior management, about the government, about the cuts, about the pension. You know, I could probably walk into a briefing room today and it will be the same topics over and over again. And managers would be like, well, if you don't like it, just go and get another job elsewhere. And you're like, oh, that's nice, isn't it? You know, we, we make you feel valued or, or yeah, what skills everyone. So a lot of people in the public sector, they don't realize the transferable skills that they have. Yeah. And that's like, there's so much people um, are given skills wise, but they're so downtrodden by maybe the management or the people around them that they don't feel confident to go out there and, and use those skills. Cause they just think, well, you know, how could I get a job? I'm just a copper. How could I get a job for yeah. more than two thousand two hundred pounds a month or or whatever? Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and that <clears throat> just that phrase touching on that phrase you said right at the end is something I hear a lot with the clients I serve. I'm just a X. Yeah, you know, I can't possibly do that. I'm just a teacher. I can't possibly do that. I'm just a lawyer. You know, I'm just a consultant. You know, I can't. I, that's all I do. And I think people are so you know. Sometimes it does take a coach or or someone else to help actually unearth the skills, the qualities they have, the experiences they've amassed in in those years that are transferable to so many different situations. And you've kind of shared a little bit about, I suppose, a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of the experiences you had in the police. So it's a bit of a no brainer, the, the question I'm, I'm about to ask. But was there a catalyst for you that then actually made you transition from the police and and look outside? Yeah, I, I think it actually comes down to a Theresa May. I think was the was the beginning. <laughs> what a dancer, by the way! What a, what an amazing dancer for all of those uh, for all of those who haven't seen Theresa May dance. Pop it in YouTube. You, you'll thank me later. But go on. Um, I'm sorry to sort of name drop on your on your podcast, but she she was the catalyst, and I I can remember it now, Michael. I can, I'm sitting on my sofa at home. Um, the the the, the Conservatives have got into government. I don't want to turn this political. They come into government <laughs> and um, they're now looking at their cuts, you know. Yeah. And then the the um, the rumours about pension and then the pension review and the, are they, aren't they? And I, I remember sitting on the sofa uh, with my wife. My parents were in the room as well and the WhatsApp started going and they had pushed through the legislation. They had to change the law, I believe, to change our pensions, and I just sat there absolutely gobsmacked. The injustice that I felt inside me was just, uh, it was unbelievable. Um, you know, we'd all signed up, 2003 signed up on the dotted line, signature, federation like, best pension you can ever have. Um, you know, you'll be made for life, gold plated if you're a Daily Mail reader. Um, you know, you're slogging out your guts, you're. Some people, some people I work with, they'd planned their whole life around this pension and taking the lump sum and the, they'd planned universities for their kids and everything. They even like planned when they joined the police so that they could get the, the pension and everything. And with one like swoop, because it's an easy target, public sector can't strike some of us or, um, you know, cost a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they just took that pension away changed it yeah. overnight and I, I i yeah police officers can't strike but i went on a little strike myself i refused to do any overtime that was my my way of getting them back um <laughs> but the bitterness the bitterness inside me and that that feeling of how unfair you know and it really also caused a lot of division within the within the ranks um there's a lot of argument about what we should do about it how we should be treated you know Yes, things had to change, but do it for new starters. Don't do it for people with eight years service, 10 years service, 15 years service. And that was the catalyst. That was like, why should I bother? Yeah. Yeah. Why? And I, I can I can hear the I suppose the anger, the frustration, yeah. whatever you want to name it, in your in your voice. And I think what will be interesting, and I think I'm sure you can kind of uh, speak a little bit on this, is what can be seen as the most testing things in our life at the time 
and you can get into that victim mindset of that that you know that famous phrase of why me you know oh why me it's always me never lucky never lucky you know but then in three five ten years time you know you're sitting here talking to me and reciting about that 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 moment which you know you can be the judge and you can tell me that's what obviously put you into perhaps a better place in terms of not just professionally but personally um so yeah I, it'd be interesting to hear what what's your thoughts on that perhaps how you felt at the time to how you now look back on that moment and where you are now you know yeah um so there's, there's a few things that happened the pension it then carried on into cuts you know cuts within the public sector and you can't you can't Mon- like people is your biggest asset in the public sector and when they start stripping people you can't do anything you, you really struggle you know um, response times were struggling and I, I'm quite em- empathetic maybe policing wasn't the best thing for me to go into but you know I think I worry about what people think and if we're not delivering a great service then that's a real bugbear around, around the same time or, or similar time um, I also had a young child and um he was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So you got personal life and work life, you know, all yep. going wrong at the time. And I think that's where the stress, the stress and the strain started to build up, um, culminating in me sort of just exploding in, uh, I think it was 2015, Theresa May came out with the pension cuts or something. And then 2019, I think I had a little mini breakdown. So it was like, like a pressure cooker. There was trauma there was uh, unhappiness at work, um, stress at work, you know, um, trying to run a business with my wife as well. So trying to do all that. There's a lot of plates spinning and they say that the cup, the cup fell over and it, the cup fell over in a coffee shop, actually. Um, my wife, my wife was trying to talk to me about a staffing issue at our shop and uh, I, I was just ended up crying. She's like, oh dear, let's, uh, yeah. let's take you home. And tuck yeah. you back into bed and call a doctor. <laughs> yeah, but but, and I I don't want to understate this, I suppose, Bill. But like, I I really do appreciate you sharing like your personal journey, I suppose, because like the more and I I did a post on this a little while ago about like embracing our own vulnerabilities. Like the moment someone professes to be perfect is the moment you should be running away in the opposite direction. Mm. Because nobody is perfect in this world and no one will ever be perfect. And I think embracing our vulnerabilities and then being where you are, you know, now in terms of helping people on that journey and you have been there, you've been in their shoes. And likewise with me in terms of having, I suppose, my own kind of like uh, crisis of sorts with my dad receiving a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. I'm an only child. Um, My parents had me quite late in life. So I do a lot of kind of support, I suppose, in the the family household. Um, That was a real crunch moment for me as well and that was quite tough thankfully I have my now wife uh, to kind of support me a bit like you had yours um, but I think it's important I think it's important to share this this journey um, it's not always sunshine and rainbows no. but like my goodness if you were to like look at you now and if that future bill was to speak to that past bill you know I'm sure it'd be bloody proud of the things you've gone through and what you've done you know to, to get to where you are today you know yeah and and um, I feel sorry for my, my supervisor at the time. I'd actually been given like a really good PDR, like performance. And he said, is there anything you want to tell me? And I'm like, yeah, I'm broken. I need to take some time out. He's like, what? But, mm. but yeah, so I suppose I've always now, I kind of think you have to let opportunity in. So after, after going through the breakdown, going on to antidepressants, I was on, I was a a firearms officer at the time. So I remember sitting at home thinking, that's it. They're never going to let me, let me carry a gun again. You know, pride. I was a, I was a team leader. So, you know, there were times when I was responsible for um, all the firearm, the spontaneous firearms incidents and the whole of the county. Um, I was a medic. um, and And that was where some of the trauma sort of came from. So there's that. Now what? You know, one foul swoop they're not going to let me carry a gun again. And there was a bit of work to be done. They did. They did allow me, you know, reviewed and everything and onto medication. And it was pointed out to management, you know, who would you rather? Someone that's like put their hand up and said, I'm being medicated and I'm struggling or the ones that are struggling and not wanting to put their hands up. So yeah. management were good, 
to some extent, but something had to change. And I suppose it was being open to that opportunity. And that opportunity came along in the form of a, a Facebook ad. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. an avid Facebook user. I love the platform um, and it's really helped my, my business as well. But um, I started carrying firearms again. I started going back out on the street patrol. I had another, I went back too soon, had another little breakdown. I think management sort of said, right, well, you know, you're not, you're not coping. Um, and I went into a training role on the firearms unit, but then, um, but then they, they sort of, they were quite determined not to let me carry on within the firearms unit. And so I found myself in a garage shredding confidential waste and um, came across a Facebook advert um, saying, you know, we help, this is shift success, we help um, serving and an ex um, retired police officers start and scale their business. And I replied to it. I never did that. Never did that, you know? No. Never. And then the next thing, I, uh, I answered the phone to an unknown number. And it was then, you know, and again, I never answer the phone. But I suppose looking back, it's opening yourself up to that opportunity. You just never know what's going to come along. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, you know, a real tangible example would be like, I don't know if you like the look of a car or you kind of mention a certain car, all of a sudden the next couple of days, you think you see 20 million of them like whizzing by you. Um, and it's just what you pay attention to. Um, so I, I completely can understand, I suppose, how that happened for you and, and, and like the reasons for doing actions that you wouldn't normally do in that case. And you mentioned that shift for, uh, shift for success. So that was obviously targeting yourself and kind of policemen. I suppose, t take us through that. What, what did you then go through and what did you ultimately learn that I suppose inevitably helped aid your transition out of the place yeah so um so the phone call was um like a discovery call with one of their sales team um, mm -hmm. learning about me learning about what what I, I was interested in obviously we had the dog grooming business that me and emma we were doing we were, we were probably turning over about one hundred twenty thousand pounds a year dog grooming we had six members of staff it was what i used to call like a real beast of a business it was throwing us around we had two young children um emma was working i was working shifts or, or i was working and uh dealing with some sort of mental health issues as well so it was a real sort of beast it the business was running us and um it so happened that uh, at the time alex the owner was doing in-person um coaching and he was he had a quick start day as he called it and the idea of that day was to get potential um program members into uh, a room in Birmingham, uh, meet the coaches, uh, meet meet Alex, meet some um, some of his uh, customers already, and listen to their stories. And funny enough, I think I answer, I spoke to them on the Friday. I had a day off on the Monday, and they were doing a quick start day on a Monday. You know, you start to think about fate, and uh, it's that opportunity again, isn't it? And I remember going yeah. home on Friday night, like really sort of excited, saying to my wife. Oh, I, I want to go to Birmingham on, on Sunday night. I want to go to this quick start day and uh, and learn more about this company. And Emma's always been really supportive and knows about investing in, in herself and in her business. She was like, yeah, do it. It's, it's, you go along. I can't go because of the kids, of course, and the, and the dogs and stuff, but you go. So I found myself in Birmingham. And again, I'm outside of Kent. I'm not, I'm like outside my comfort zone in a way. I'm staying in this hotel. I've never really done this before. It's all businessy. Coppers aren't businessy. Like they like walk around in jeans and North Face jackets. They don't want to get involved in this. But um, we we went to the went to this room in in Birmingham. Listened to the to the um, the coaches, Robin Waite being one of them, and um, listened to their stories and spoke to other coppers and stuff like that. And then got given the sort of little bit of hard sell at the end, but the follow up was follow up phone calls uh, or, yeah. or Zoom calls afterwards. Because I said yeah. to Alex at the time, I cannot do anything. I'm not. I'm not falling for this sales technique. I'm not falling for this sales tactic. You're not getting me today. I cannot do anything until Emma signs off because it's her business as well. <laughs> yeah, abs absolutely. And I think 
again, we 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 can touch on vape and and what that means for for different people. You know, whether you just think it's a coincidence or or, or not. But I I look back at my life, and I, I suppose I can only talk about what, what I I'm, I'm aware of and that kind of diagnosis from my dad. I mean, I had my parents had me quite late in life, so I'm I'm um I'm only going to be 29 in April. My dad's in his early 70s, um, and but for that to happen. And I, I, we, we were aware, we felt like that was going that way. That for me was my catalyst and that kind of shook me to my core. And it does, it, it chucks everything up in your life and you start looking at things in a bit more detail and thinking, you know, do I really want to do this for, for the rest of my life? Or, mm. you know, what, what do I want to, when I'm, got, you know, that age is similar to my dad, what do I want to look back on my life or, or the things I've done and the people I've served and ultimately the legacy, I, I suppose I, I kind of leave. Um, and and I think for me that that you know the the events that kind of soon followed that in terms of what I did and finding coaching and finding courses and you know discount codes popping up exactly the right time and all the rest of it you know I I, I think the stories we tell ourselves is probably more important if you believe in fate or not <laughs> you know I, I think we just I just take that on and go well it's all it's all meant to be and it's only going to help me and it just goes to that positive mindset piece rather than, oh, I can't be bothered, I can't see it, I'm not letting this opportunity in. You know, whether we believe fate or not, it doesn't matter. It's more, you know, do we believe this story, this journey is is, is meant to serve us or mm. do we think the world is against us? Yeah, and that reminds me of a saying that, um, like, the mentors kind of say, and it's opening yourself up to opportunity, isn't it? But you've got to be your own hero. No yeah. one's going to come along and, and rescue you, you know. I could have... I, I, I could have, I was told to go and get another job, you know, within the police, I had to go and find another job. No one was there. No one was going to sort of rescue me. No one was going to say, um, you've got to do it yourself, haven't you? No matter what yeah. you feel, you've got to be your own hero and take that yeah. action. Yeah, absolutely. And and from there, you know, I, I, I saw, you know, from knowing you and kind of seeing your business and how, how it's growing and, 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 I suppose for me though, beyond that, the core principles from an outsider, outside I see you do, one of which I think is like helping, I would say pet groomers achieve success, but with less stress and not being run by the business, a bit like what yeah. you said, the business is running you. I mean, we can, I can clearly see where that's come from in terms of your personal circumstances and the things you've kind of overcome and how that is like fed into your coaching method and your coaching principles it'd be really interesting to know, do you have like a practical example almost of how you've not, you know, yes, that's your philosophy, but how have you implemented that philosophy with through the programs or one-to-one -to, -one to then help others, you know, embrace that success, but, but do it in a way that serves them and their, their wider life as well. Um, I suppose it's, it's through learning our own journey, wasn't it? And um, to, so I walked out of that room in Birmingham, March 2020. So the phone was going off because of lockdown. And um, obviously we had some time at home and the, the coaching went online and it was starting to learn learn more about our business. But a, a big key of that was starting to read as well, reading business books and opening up, the, opening up our mindset. And um, Alex, the, the guy that runs Shift Success, he's really good. Uh, he's so positive and his mindset's so positive and he's really good at, at shining a light on all of your skills that you have as a person and your transferable, transferable skills. So I've taken that and shine the light on the pet groomers and, you know, they're not, they're not just shaving off dogs or scissoring feet, but all the other skills they have, you know, communication yeah. skills, handling skills. And, and so, yeah, so a real practical example of that is the the sort of just explaining them to them and showing them what other skills they have, and and that people don't just use their services because of the price; they use their services because of because of them. Yeah, you know, and that's what Alex is kind of our mentors have kind of shine shone a light with us as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think <clears throat> if you want to boil it down even even more, like I think for me you look at the world and yes, there's nuance to certain examples. You know, I, I take that, but money just follows value. 
So and it, it, it doesn't matter how you're serving or delivering value. Money just kind of follows value. Yeah. So whether it's cut, cutting sheep or, you know, you said like, you know, the dog grooming or whatever you're doing or making food, doesn't matter what you're doing. It just follows that value. And that that value for that pet groomer, it's not just kind of dog grooming. It's the joy and the love that you're actually creating for that family and all the rest of it. When that when the pet owner comes back and they have their, their little dog and they kind of, you know, they see the dog's happy and, you know, wagging its tail away, you're creating that sense of joy in someone. Yeah. Um, and you could almost say that sense of joy is priceless to a certain point. Yeah. So I, I think it's really powerful what, what you're saying. And I, I did a, a, an actual podcast around this with my audience. Uh, it was like reasons why people use you. And mm. I got to the end of the podcast and I or the live, and I said to the audience, what haven't I mentioned? There's one thing that I've purposely not mentioned in this whole live stroke podcast. And I was like, oh, I'm sure. It's like, I've not mentioned money. Yeah. You know, you people will choose you because of all these reasons. It's not about the money. And, yeah. you, you know, we joined, um, we joined Shift Success. We didn't even think, well, I didn't think, um, it was a possibility of, of, of me help, of me, I don't know if you even joined with me thinking I'm going to leave the police, but it was to help the business. And again, it's like going in there with an open mind. What could happen? I suppose yeah. when I when I when we joined the mentorship, it was more it was more about helping us get control of our grooming business. My business itself hadn't hadn't even been born. I've got a vision board without my business on it, without anything that I'm doing now on it. It was all about the dog grooming business. So it's just allowing, again, allowing yourself to open up to that opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. And on, on that, opening yourself up to opportunity, for me, that's clearly, you know, in that mindset area that, that you've done that. And of course, as a practical shift, you had to make, you know, post-policing in terms of the nature of the work and, and some of the things you were doing. But for me, the bigger piece is that mindset shift, you know, not just a, I'm just a policeman. You know, there's far more that you were capable of doing and clearly have done. Mm. How do you now, you've kind of, we've shared a few of the steps and the journey you've taken. It'll be interesting for me. One of my values is lifelong learning. And I think that's, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be there, but I think it's incredibly important for someone in that kind of coaching industry to always evolve, always grow and pass on those lessons to the people you serve. But how do you keep up with that? How do you continue to grow your own mindset uh, mindset and kind of keep it keep it in a positive space you know we're none of us we're all human we all have dips um yeah. I, I wonder how you kind of undertake that now yeah i mean mentors have mentors right you know you yep. can't you wouldn't go to a uh, a bankrupt uh, finance financial advisor would you or a bankrupt money coach you, yep. you've got to you've got to you've got to practice what you preach so I've got mentors. I've got, um, you know, I'm part of several um, group mentorships. So all, all in all, over over the last four years, because it's 2020 when we did the shift to success, over the last four years, I've me and Emma, or, uh, as a business, we've invested about £10,000 in mentorship in one form or another. Mostly group. It's not. I've not had any sort of one-to-one -one mentorship. Um, so... We've always got that fallback. And, and that's one thing when I resigned from the police, I always knew um, it's all right. I'm not doing it on my own. Obviously, I've got my wife with me, but I've got a team of mentors and a community behind me that um, if if and when, and when I did have down days, they'd pick you up and say, yeah. right, you know, everyone goes to this. Don't worry. Try this. Try that. You know, give you other ideas. Accountability buddies as well. I mean, that was fantastic idea that Alex Alex would pair you up with accountability buddies every every month um, you'd learn about their business they'd learn about your business and you'd just be accountable to them and say right this week I'm working on a brochure and I want to get it out you know mm. so, but it was also not just not just the fact that you're doing that work but it's talking to other people and, and talking out your problems so yeah, so having mentors. So if you are to, if you're going to look for a mentor, make sure they've got mentors because that's how they're going to grow. One another observation that I made, because um, being the policey person that I am or, or was, and probably still have that same sort of mentality, was a bit like here. 
I'm looking behind you, looking at your bookshelf, you know, looking at yeah. what books you've got and yeah. one th- and picking up on all the little nuances that coaches say. So I worked out that a lot of my, my mentors had all done a particular program, Daniel Priestley's Key Person of Influence. And then I yeah. worked out, well, that's how they all met each other. That's how they all met up. But um, then the next thing was they all read. They all read books. They're constant, constantly reading books. And whenever you you go to business conferences and or where there's coaches involved or mentors, they always talk about the books they read. And that's another way to really sort of open your mind to to new ideas. Um, I think I think it's Andrew Priestley who was a is a mentor on Chief Success, and he always says he tries to he, whenever he reads a business book. And his, the business books he reads are probably worth money because he scribbles in the margins and stuff. But his goal of a business book is to make £10,000 out of that book. And he'll read it and read it and reread it and write in it and stuff. And it just shows you like the, how powerful was reading all these books and it all sort of starts sinking in and gives you new ideas. and Or, um, or, or you learn that they've done that, tried that, didn't work. So here's the answer to it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, thank you so much for sharing that, Bill. And I think there, there's so many things I suppose I resonate with. Like, I think first and foremost, like you said, it, we, I think I very much have the same philosophy in the coaching world. So like re, every coach should have a coach, you know, every therapist often, often has a therapist. Mm. Um, and and I'm, I'm no different to that. I, I've had a coach since I first started and still do to this day. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to, you know, Yes, you can say all the words, but your actions speak far louder. Uh, and, and yeah, the, the, the books, you're, you're bang on. I think for me, in terms of a, a bit of a routine that I built myself, there's a, a chap that listeners will probably have heard of in Ali Abdul. Um, and I I liked reading, but I didn't like reading physical books. So I was a bit of a weirdo. I don't, I don't like no. So all these books here, I've um, I've either bought them for my wife or my wife's bought them. And then I've got the electronic copy of, of them. So, so I, I love the fact of just, get, so I, uh, through Ali Abdul, I kind of found out through Kindles, bought a Kindle. So I've got them all downloaded. Um, I often get just to test them and then if they're good, then I buy them. So it's a, a, a sneaky <laughs> system. Um, but when I, every time I go to bed, I go to bed half hour early, do my usual routine, brush my teeth. Mm. I dim my lights. I sit in bed and for about 20, 15, 20 minutes every night, I try and read my little Kindle. And I just read it, it slowly kind of drifts me off to bed and it's just built into my routine. And you, you've read another book talking about books now, Atomic Habits and Building yeah. Habits. Yeah. That's a, that is obviously that building that habit, that even routine that then allows me to kind of build that into my process where I don't even think about it. Almost like a robot. It's just, oh, where's my book? It, my Kindle's right next to my bedside table. And it's just, it just happens almost through osmosis. I don't even realize it's happening. So I, I think that's, that's, that's really good. And go on, go on, you're going to, you're going to share yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, oh, if you can't read them, I, I struggle reading, um, but the audible versions yep. you know, as well. Yep. And I, you've got to, I've got, you know, if there's anyone that's going to write a book, you've got to narrate it as well. Cause um, the re- most recent book I've been listening to is um, Be Be Useful by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, and I don't think if I'd read that book, I don't think I would have got the same value from it for, as I have from listening to it. I've listened to it now yeah. four times um, because you just learn so much more about the book by the author talking it through and how yeah. they express certain words and and uh, punctuate certain uh, sentences and the passion the passion that you get from their voice whilst they're reading it. So yeah. yeah. And that's that's like the the habit that I really sort of value um, from from the mentors and stuff is that continual learning and reading. Absolutely, or listening. Absolutely, and, and, I, and I can. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, but and, and podcast for me is I was going to say is an obvious uh, thing to, as well that adds on to that. Whether it's you know whether you're a visual learner, audio learner, kind of there's, there's so many means out there that can best serve you um mm. you know whether you're driving occasionally driving in the car half hour could be an audio it uh, could be a podcast as well you know and you know when i sometimes get back home i then chuck it on the video and then i kind of carry on watching that podcast so yeah there's there's so many means out there to for people to learn and you know there's so many cliches around like you know you are who you surround yourself with you know you're the oh, yeah. you're, you're three closest friends and stuff like that which i i think is incredibly powerful and although cliche 
and I hate to say it, most cliches are cliche because they're true. Um, the, the books, the podcast, the Audible is a way to surround yourself with those people um, and to expand your network. So, yes, you might not be able to see you know, yourself with um, Ali Abdul or Daniel Priestley or Stephen Bartlett or all these people, but you can, in a virtual sense, they can be your immediate closest free people. They can be your close network through consuming their books, their podcasts, and their, their kind of uh, products as well. Yeah. Um, and that's not just a feed and aspect of consumerism. That's the feed and aspect of changing your mindset because it's very hard sometimes to think and feel something that you can't see and you can't hear around you. Yeah, and, and of course these books um, are all positive. They're all encouraging you to stretch yourself. They're all encouraging, encouraging you to go some a lot of the time against the norm or, or introducing new practices that you've never heard of. Um, and I'm a great believer in sharing that as well, sharing that knowledge. So I'll yeah. always recommend people listening to, or if I've enjoyed a book, sort of pass that on. Um, what you're saying about surrounding yourself with successful people um that resonates with a, again a podcast i think if we're going to name drop jason jason gradestone um did about he you know he's he's a multi-millionaire investor but he then went and surrounded himself with billionaires you know and, and listened yeah. to and worked with them for a few days and you, the, the the saying goes is if you look at your your three or five nearest friends isn't it and what they earn that's pretty much what you're earning so, yeah. which was obviously the same in the police because I was surrounded by, by cops that are all on fixed wages. But um, when you start surrounding yourself with higher people, you start to to live that higher life, I suppose. Absolutely, and I, and whatever you want to call it, higher life, your energy, your frequency, yeah. whatever it is, it, you know, it's all the same thing. And and the the key thing I would share with all that, you know, it's really good to have that 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 seed, that thought, wherever it is, however you kind of ingest it, it's incredibly important. But the thing that I'm learning more and more with the clients I serve and in my own journey, all of that is worth nothing if you don't take action. Yeah. It's incredibly important. It's incredible. You know, you wouldn't even be in that place if you hadn't learned and listened to those kind of podcasts, read those books and got those new kind of ideas around the ways of working in the world. If you don't take action, a bit like what you said about the accountability groups, whether it's networking, whatever it is, whatever means you use, whatever tool you utilize, without that action, nothing has happened. It's still You're still sitting there and doing the same life and with the same identity uh, and not achieving those goals and aspirations you have. So with, with, with that in mind, I suppose, Bill, it, it'd be interesting. We kind of shared a lot about your journey, your transition, some of the things you now do to this day to continue on that path and hopefully this helps listeners with their own kind of shift in their mindset. Looking now towards the future, I suppose, what are your goals and your aspirations, both as a, as a coach or even wider? What, what does, you know, your future hold for you, you know, in, in terms of what you would like to achieve? Yeah. One thing, one thing I've, I've sort of always heard people say, and, and you do see it is people will do something for a while, then they'll get bored and then move on. And I think that's really, that's, I think some coaches can do that. Um, so I want to make sure that whatever I do is sustainable. Um, I, I haven't, it's not my work. When I, when I do coaching, it's not the Bill Bet show. Um, I work alongside associate coaches. So I've got different people uh, involved in my program. So to take some of the slack, but also to deliver their knowledge as well. And I want my, my um, students or my, my clients to have the same access to the to the people that I sort of um, talk to and stuff because they can they can help them as well. So I think a little bit is just systemization. Like I said before, I kind of implement something and then work out all the little details behind the scenes. So getting a bit more structured that does frustrate me a bit. Um, freeing up a bit more of my time with maybe um, taking on um, some staff, some sales staff and stuff. But then just playing with it and seeing where it goes. Like yesterday, um, it was yesterday, Tuesday, I I was I was meeting with a lady from America. She'd come over to the UK. She is like the business coach for pet groomers in the US. And um, we went out for the day. I showed her around uh, Canterbury and I showed her around our salon. We had some lunch. And then today she's messaging me saying, I'd love to come back to the UK maybe in November. Perhaps we can do a conference together. 
I'm like, and you just don't know where these things go, do you? You no. get these DMs come into your inbox or it's being open to that opportunity again, isn't it? And you just don't know where that's going to go. So um, the DM might come in saying, oh, um, I'd like to have a chat with you. Say yes. Just say yes. You know, okay, it might be half an hour of your time that's wasted, but you just never know who that person's going to be and what, what they're going to uh, highlight for you. Yeah. And I, a, a, a typical, and, and it seems obvious when I say it, but some people don't kind of um, aware of this is when people are thinking about those opportunities that arise or reaching out to someone on LinkedIn and they're scared to do so often, I will always say, okay, let's, let's, let's indulge those fears. Let's indulge those insecurities. What is the absolute worst case scenario that could happen in that situation? Like you reach out to them on LinkedIn and they ignore you and what you feel like a sausage for a couple of days, you know, that's the absolute worst case scenario in that situation. Okay, great. Cool. What is now the best case scenario when you reach out to that person? And yeah. they go, well, I could reach out. Then they could meet me maybe on Zoom. Maybe they give me some opportunities. Maybe it even leads to a job. And I go, okay. Yeah. Um, How do you feel about kind of like proceeding and going forwards now? And often people are like, once, so, once you actually like delve into those insecurities and fears, because we're often scared of what we, the unknown, we're scared of what we don't know then people actually start to realise, okay, maybe I can move past this. And it, if it, if the fear or the opportunity of me looking like a sausage or feeling silly for a couple of days, you know, if that's all that I have to pay for to actually reach out and I could potentially even increase my network and actually get a job or transition out of it and how that would make me feel, you know, that all of a sudden that fear, that insecurity disappears and people take action and move forward. Yeah. So, the, go on, go on. You're very right. You know, you just... Just, just say yes. I'd be open to opportunities. Don't try and sell either. You know, I don't think that's always the right way. When people appear in your DMs and your your uh, emails, make connections. You know, invite yeah. them onto your podcast. Invite them for Zoom calls. Tell them about what you do. Um, I've always found that like I've always found that helpful. And build your network as well. So if someone comes to me and says, "What I've what I think people have appreciated is I've come into the the pet grooming world and I've been useful." going back to sort of uh, Arnie's book, Be Useful. I've been useful to them. So I've come into a face, I've built a Facebook community. And when someone says, oh, I'm struggling with a HR contract, I'm like, right, go and speak to Megan from your yeah. HR handle. Oh, I'm struggling with my accounts. Go and speak to Vicky from the pet accountant. Go and speak to, you know, a bookkeeper who I know. Or I, I need a logo design. Go and speak to Lauren, you know. And I've always got that network. And people start to say, oh, you know a lot of people. But also, you're giving me lots of help, you know, yeah. lots of help. Yeah. And people really appreciate that. So um, that's how you build these contacts, isn't it? Just by talking to people and and um, biting the bullet um, and not not being worried about people saying no. And, and, and you don't ask, you don't get, I suppose. My, yeah. um, the, when, when, you, when I was in the police... The firearms unit was very much like seen as outsiders a bit, bit like elite. You know, we like to hair gel and eight crayons is what normal coppers sort of said about us. Um, it's not true. They're really nice. Firearms officers are really nice people. And, you know, I've always sort of said we're some of the friendliest people at the end of a gun. And um, we'd walk into a police station sometimes and you'd walk in there and everyone would be like, oh. I don't want. I don't. Wanna, I don't. I don't want to look up. I don't want to make eye contact. I don't want to talk to them. You know, they're probably going to want to give me some work or or give me something griefy. You walk into a a, a room with business people, and everyone's like, "Hi, how are you doing? Oh, what do you do? Oh, right. Have you you know?" And you start having conversations, and then you're like, "Oh, have you heard of this app? Or have you looked at that app? Or you know, I've got a VA that might be able to help you with that." And you're like, "Everyone's so friendly and open." <laughs> You know, it's really yeah. interesting, really interesting. It, it is interesting. And different cultures, different environments can create, you know, different situations. Mm. But, you know, no matter how you word it, whatever semantics you use, I think what you're saying there is always, if you can always serve from a place of value, you know, value, mm. you know, will just go round in circles. And I just think for me, and especially in my coaching practice and how I approach life, you know, I, I have a bit of a mantra that kind of, 
was taken back handed from a chap called Naval Ravikant. But it's it's long term games with long term people. I'm not in here to make, you know, three years, five years to make a quick buck, to nick people's money and then bugger off. That's not what I'm about. My goal, my why is to wake up with the sole focus of inspiring people to do what inspires them. And I want to do that when I'm 50, 60, 70, 80. I even had a conversation with Jesse the other day. The way of work has changed. The whole work to your 60 odd and then retire and with your feet on the beach, it, that, it, it's, that, it's a fallacy. That pension's not there, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I don't want to touch the nerves, Bill, so I, I, I'll bring back the trauma. But, it, yeah. but it's, it's true, it's true. It like, and, and for me, an ideal life, for me, I can see myself, touch wood, grandparents or great-grandparents to, to whatever family I have, working half a day a week when I'm like 75, 80, still giving value, still, whether it's a podcast, whether it's just helping business owners, with all my knowledge, all my experience I've amassed over those years, I think for me, that's a perfect life. I'd still work an half a day a week or a day a week, keeping the mind ticking and still giving value. Um, and I think the more, you know, unfortunately the way of the world is chase quick money, get the Rolex, get the Bugatti and all the rest of it, you know, but the way of the world, unfortunately is forcing people to kind of chase that, those quick wins. But for me, there's so much more satisfaction and fulfillment in long-term games. And mm. that's hence with the coaching. Yes, I can help you, but let's not just make you feel good for a day and then you revert back to the norm. Let's go deeper and actually make a transformation that when I'm gone, because it's not about me, mm. when I'm gone, you still have the skills and tools to then pursue your own journey and actually transform your life. That's it. And I had someone comment on this, comment on a post of mine today saying, if you can guarantee uh, I'll make profit, then I'll sign up. And it's like, well, actually, there's no guarantee that you'll ever, you know, if you do the work, you're going to, you are going to make the money, but do my program. But this isn't like 18 months learning and then you'll forget it when you finish. This is lifelong learning, isn't it? Yeah. And this is what you, what you mean. You're changing that mindset. You're changing that person. And coaching can bring up some real tough um, thoughts and, and make you really sort of think about, who you are and what you're doing. And I have, you know, it can sometimes be a bit painful at times, but that's, that does also help you to learn. I always say to, to people, you've got to be vulnerable. You've got to, you've got to open up. You've got to talk and, and be vulnerable because the more vulnerable you are, the more help you're going to receive and, and, and take in. Absolutely. And, and just to kind of, uh, to pull our, our, our podcast to a close, Bill, it, I, a question I often ask most of my guests, and it'd be really interesting to get your take. It'd be for for that younger Bill, perhaps pre post uh, pre post of a uh, police uh, service. Um, maybe doesn't have the, the the big bushy beard that 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 you have now. That that younger the younger Bill. If you were to give that younger Bill a piece of advice or or, or have a a conversation with him, what 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 would you say? Yeah, so um, you know going back to 2000 say 2000 20 years old we had no we just about had the internet didn't we then so things were so much different there's no podcasting there's no no youtube but it i think it would have to be go and dig out those sort of books you know rich dad poor dad all those sort of all those sort of books that were around then and still are around but continue that learning continue that um journey and trust and believe in yourself i think that's that's been a big a big thing through through life you know you can you're good enough and you can do it and trust your own decisions and actually things always work out hmm. whatever you do you know quite often things will always work out for you no i, I love that and it it perfectly encapsulates how i feel and you know i just i spoke to someone a client yesterday um, and they said, I, you know, I'm getting all this advice, left, right and centre. I don't know what to do. I don't know what the right choice is. And I said, ah, oh, the right choice. And he said, yes. And he said, what is the right choice? Well, and then he thought about it and go, oh, well, the right choice is what I want to do. I said, okay, yeah, what do you yeah. want to do? And all of a sudden we started to kind of all that noise of, yeah, but this is what you've got to do. And this is a five-year plan. And, you know, you've got to invest this because then you'll get the optimum returns and all this, all this, I suppose, nonsense or noise. But the, the right choice, there is no right choice. The right choice is what you think you want to do in that moment. With the, the inf you know, you make an informed decision about where you are. You make that decision, you reflect on that decision and you move forward. And that is simply is life is this, this wonderful life. It's not some game where you get to the boss 
and you're like, oh, I've got to do this X, Y, Z, and then I beat this level and I get to the boss level, you know. And I know you like your PlayStation as well, so I thought I'd chat that in for you, yeah. Bill. But 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 like life is full of experiences, it's full of decisions, and we simply if we can look back and reflect on the things that have happened, and we can then you know make different um, pivots or, or, or based on what our experiences, then great. You know, as long as you can learn from, and from your reflections and your experiences, and you can take that forward in however you spend your life then I, that, for me, is the right choice, I suppose. Yeah, and it reminds me of a quote, I, I can't quote it word for word, but it's in Arnie's book, Be Useful. Um, you know, this isn't practice. This you, this you only get one of these lives. This isn't, this isn't practice. So go out there. You could take some action. And, you know, if, you've, if you're listening and uh, you're worried about money, I, I work with a money coach, and she will openly say she's been happy rich, she's been happy poor, She's been sad rich. She's been sad poor. Is it about yeah. the money? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if people, um, I hope they've, they've got kind of good, uh, a lot of value. We speak a lot about value, but got value from the conversation we've had today. Um, maybe they, indeed they are a pet groomer. Or they're looking to even venture into that avenue. I'll be sure to kind of include some links into the show notes, but where's the best place to, to find you, Bill? Yeah, so obviously I've got a website. Um, petpassiontoprofit.com but the best place to go is um, social media so Facebook group Dog Grooming Business Help and Support and then you can find the podcast and the podcast has yes it's aimed at dog groomers but the podcast could help lots of people that want to get into business or are in business because of the the volume of guests I, I sort of interview around it and that's the same Dog Grooming Business Help and Support amazing well f thank you for your time bill uh You're thank welcome. you for being your uh kind of honest and transparent self as always and sharing your journey um and hopefully to the listeners you know that's given you a real uh, reality of someone who has made that transition themselves you know it's not all sunshine and rainbows but they've kind of given a real clear picture of where they were and where they are now today and if that's promoted kind of a, a feeling inside yourself around transitioning in your own career um i'll be sure to include a link to myself to help guide, support and challenge you on your own journey as well. But until then, thanks again for listening to Catapult Your Career and I'll see you on the next one.